This is the Sergio Rodriguez Show. Welcome, everybody, to the Sergio Rodriguez Show, a show unlike any other. Joining me today from the Libre Initiative, the president of the Libre Initiative, my good friend, Daniel Garza. Dan, how are you? Sergio, it's always a pleasure to speak with you, man, and a big hello to everybody uh, up in the Northeast. I love I love when you come on because you educate me, my brother. And and and, and today's today's interview is no different. I wanted to have you on for three reasons. Number one, I want to discuss the first 60 or so days in the Biden administration. I also want to discuss the gas issues that are going on right now in the country. And then obviously the big topic that I want to discuss is the immigration situation that's going on at the border. And we're going to get to that. But, you know, you're a guy who has been involved in politics forever. You were at the White House for a number of years in the Bush administration, the son. What do you think of what President Biden has done in his first 60 days so far? Well, I mean, I think it's been very ambitious. I think it's been very center left. Um, in fact, extreme almost at some point. Um, I also think that in, in a very real way, um, Joe Biden misled the American public. He lied about wanting to bring the country together. I mean, he, he has uh, not worked across the aisle. Uh, he is not a moderate. Uh, so in that sense, it's been kind of a disappointment. Um, he, I think also he had worked um, to... Uh, the, the first opportunity was, was the whole situation that Nancy Pelosi was driving in the impeachment process. He could have stopped it, but he chose not to. And then, of course, it got derailed because there was not enough to impeach. And already that sort of set the tone uh, that um, somebody else was going to call the shot. Correct. Uh, and, and it's been disappointing ever since, uh, to be honest with you. Um, has he brought the nation together? I don't think so. Um, so that's been uh, just on, on, on its own merits uh, disappointing. I haven't even got into policy yet. I think what's brought the country to a little bit of peace has really been that the people that were in an uproar got rid of the president, right? I mean, so with Trump not being in power, I think it kind of kept everybody now, I guess, satisfied. Would you, well, would you agree? Well, yeah, but I don't know. Uh, for um, uh, Look, I don't know if being anti-Trump is, strategy for um, a successful agenda, you know, um, you, you still have to govern, right? And what are your ideas? And what are the policies? And throwing out 11,000 union members who are building the Keystone Pipeline out of work um, to start off with uh, wasn't a, a good decision right out of the box. Uh, what's going on at the border um, is, is really, I think he has failed to bring order and control there. And he's lost control uh, in, in a very real way. Uh, wokery has sort of taken over the American culture, and I don't think that's a positive sign. Um, you're you're already starting to hear um, that we're going to get tax increases across the board. Um, the spending that was done with the COVID relief was anything but COVID relief. Uh, it was to bail out states that had a mass incredible debt uh, that were pre-COVID that had nothing to do with COVID. And here we are, you know, states that were very responsible in their spending are not having to bail out states that were not, like California and New York. Um, it's unfair. Uh, it's just these kind of things that have been very disappointing, you know, where where is the moderation? Uh, you know, be, being somebody who's going to unite the country doesn't mean I get everything I want, you get nothing. You know, I have always been one of these guys that respects the presidency because I've always viewed it that way. I've never viewed it through the prism of, of the person that's in power, right? So I've always looked at it as, okay, well, what does it do for my current situation? You know, when I was a younger person, I looked at certain things that affected me more than I do now at 46, correct, right? So who I sure. looked at the president or the, the policies varied. Where do you see this administration going moving forward because watching him speak the other day or yesterday, I should say 
really didn't comfort me that this guy's going to be able to go four years, that the president's going to be able to do four years, you know, at his age. And I, I mean, I'm concerned about that. I really am. Well, Sergio, uh, fundamentally, you have to ask yourself the question, is government securing my rights? Because that's, that's why government exists. It's to secure the rights of the individuals, right? Um, and when we talk about, you know, are we centralizing more power, more money, and more control in the hands of politicians and bureaucrats, or are we reversing that, that uh, calculus and actually empowering the individual to innovate, to uh, launch new businesses, to be an entrepreneur, to you know, seek out enterprise uh, and, and create productivity. Because it's productivity that's going to create opportunity and jobs, like real products and services that make your life better. Are we allowing for that? Uh, or, or are we actually making Washington, D.C., our federal government, more powerful? And when you look at this administration, they have chosen to centralize more power, more money, and more control in the hands of Washington, D.C. And that, that is the dangerous calculus because, you know, as the, the, the power and control of Washington, D.C. increases, proportionally, our power and control diminishes as individuals, as business owners, as family members, as, you know, they have, you know, look, I, I know we've gone through this whole situation with COVID and, and it has, in a very real sense, restricted a lot of our rights. Uh, but I've never seen the, the kind of power grab uh, that, that we're seeing right now uh, in that our ability to attend church, to launch our businesses and to be open uh, you know, for private enterprise uh, has been extremely restricted. Uh, our kids can't even go back to school yet. And, and there's another area you know, with that, where we're seeing an inadequacy on part of this administration. So, look, I, I want to be optimistic that productivity is going to increase, that uh, businesses are going to get back to uh, the way they were. Um, but it's like, you almost have to do it in spite of this administration. Dan, you brought up, a, you, you brought up something very interesting and, and it's a topic that I, I really didn't even think about speaking to you about, but you mentioned it. So I'm going to ask it before I ask you about the gas situation here in the United States. Where do you stand on, do you, where do you stand on the teachers union? It seems to me like they're trying to take advantage of this situation to not go back to work in school because look i get that some people can say that it's not safe okay i think if you have an underlying situation i get it right but when i look at these situations with the teachers it seems to me like they're trying to benefit from not having to pay child care for their own kids not trying to do certain things and in a lot of situations a lot of teachers have been shown to be taking secondary jobs on the side because they're only working at home. Where do you stand with the teachers union and what's going on in the country? Well, look, I, I live in Texas and we have, uh, we are leading the way in opening our businesses back and opening up schools again. Um, and in fact, uh, the infection rates have dramatically dropped uh, and Florida is showing exactly the same thing. Uh, they're almost on pace with us. Um, look, you have to trust individuals. You have to trust Americans to do the right thing. We know what to do. We know to wear masks. We know to keep distance, you know, social distancing, um, to reduce the, the possibilities of infection. And you know, we've been following the science. And yet, the the, the teachers' unions uh, refuse to uh, follow the science. You know, and, and it's actually our children that are at the, the least at risk here uh, of, of COVID infection or um, uh, morbidity. And, and so in, in a very real way, um, it, it's, uh, it, one has to question their motives as to you know, what's going on. Look, I'm not going to question the motives of teachers. I, I want to believe that they are dedicated, uh, industrious individuals you know, who care about the children. Uh, but I'm not seeing that in, in, in the school union. So there's a lot of frustration, Sergio, uh, on the part of the American people uh, that our children are not back at school and learning and, and they are actually regressing in their educational progress. Because at the end of the day, that's, that's what it's about. You know, um, access to a quality education that is going to position our kids for success in the marketplace is essential. And yet um, it, it's being treated as something that, that could wait when it, it cannot. And we're already starting to see a lot of the test results uh, that are coming back 
that show that, are, that are, our, our children have dramatically regressed in their educational game. Hey, listen, I don't need to see stats for that, Dan. I have a 13-year-old and a 16-year-old, yep. okay? They are getting better grades, and they're not getting smarter. I'm sorry. They're not. They're not. So I don't need to see some stat to tell me that the kids are not getting smarter and that they're regressing. I'm living it. I see it. So, no, I look at I I can sense the, you know how how livid you are, and I, I, again I think it's reflective of America at large and the parents who are livid livid uh, 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 of of what is going on with our children and these school unions that refuse you know to 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 open up the schools again, um, and that that our politicians are, are cowering in the corner uh, and won't stand up to these school unions is even more infuriating. So I, I hear you loud and clear, my brother. Speak to me about the gas issue here going on in this country because about about two months ago, and I'm not going to, look, I, I don't want to make this uh, uh, a Trump was doing X and a Biden administration is doing Z. I, I, I'm not going to make it about that. I'm going to make it about the facts. The fact is, two months ago, I had the same essentially in my state. I'm going to say the restrictions were the same. Maybe, maybe now a little bit less. And I think if, if, if we had restrictions in the 60%, we're at 65 or 70% now. So it's not like if all of a sudden everybody was allowed to just go out and drive. I saw everybody doing what they do anyway. Two months ago, we were paying a dollar something for gas. Now it's, it's like every week it's going up. Talk to me about it. Where, where, where do you see this ultimately, you know, topping out? <clears throat> That's a tough one to call. You know, Sergio, these things go up and down depending on supply and demand. Uh, and right now, you know, summer's coming. People are going to be vacationing. People are, you know, um, are going to hit the, the, the road uh, and do getaways. Um, and so that, that, there's always these sort of surges. But, but here, I think there's also a sense that, uh, you know, the, what the Biden did in, in, uh, in one of the first steps that they took, I already mentioned it, you know, uh, shutting down the Keystone Pipeline. Already, you know, you, you get this impression that there's going to be less you know, oil uh, producing uh, gas, you know, for the American consumer. And that begins to, you know, sort of, you know, hit at your psyche. I mean, and, and, and folks pounce, you know, OPEC has decided to, to continue to curtail production uh, during the month of April. Uh, and so, you know, th that's a constraint that, that we're going to see as we move into the future. You know, Trump had stood up to OPEC and actually uh, re reversed their decisions in the past to, to uh, reduce productivity. Um, but, but we know that, that um, even though it's lost some of its grip on the U.S. fuel market uh, in America, uh, it is still the leading petroleum producer in the world. And so when it announces that it's going to stop production or reduce uh, production, uh, and, and then, of course, that we know that the demand for, for gas is going to go up, these things happen. But there's no question that sometimes I think the administration sets the table for either um, the long long term trend of you know the paying less for gas or long term trend of paying more for gas. So I think there's going to be a lot of hurt coming uh, as we move into the long term uh, future. Was this something that now you were in a, in a you know you spent a lot of time in the White House and you were in administration in a Republican administration at the time, right? Was that something yeah. that you saw? Well, two questions. One, was it something that you guys discussed? Was it something that President Bush felt was part of the agenda, the gas prices in the country? And number two, does it vary much from Democrats to Republicans? I mean, it'll vary, right? Because there, um, Republicans tend to be uh, pro all of the above when it comes to energy. That includes you know, production of fossil fuels or petroleum. Uh, that includes everything from renewable energy to you know, the latest in innovative uh, things to increase uh, our energy sources. And Republicans will also argue or, or uh, negotiate to open up more of our public land. I mean, America owns one third of the entire real estate of the country. Uh, we, we are one of the biggest real estate owners in the world. Um, you know, we, we own 93% of Nevada. 80% of Alaska. We own the uh, entire outer continental shelf, you know, uh, uh, on our ocean. And so uh, how do we produce oil from that? Well, Republicans tend to be very friendly to that. 
while the Biden administration has decided they're going to close uh, and, and or reduce dramatically production of energy on public land and our outer continental shelf. So then OPEC gets its, uh, um, its sign from that. So th- th- there is, like I said, a lot that an administration can do to, to tilt the scale when it comes to the supply and demand of oil, and which, of course, affects. Yeah. All right. Speak to me about this immigration issue. Every day <clears throat> I swing by my mom's house or my dad's house and they're watching, particularly my mom, who's always watching Univision, right? There's some type of situation going down on the board. And I've been following it from afar just as someone trying to educate themselves. What exactly is the main issue that is arising from the situation at the border right now? Okay, from what I understand it and what you're hearing from observers is that the Biden administration, especially Joe Biden's narrative, his um, way of describing how he was going to be more empathetic and humanitarian and, and fair when it came to immigrants was essentially a welcome to immigrants to come to the border uh, and that they would be allowed in. And, and you even saw that with the shirt that said, you know, the, the Joe Biden, please let us in and all this sort of stuff. There were also certain changes to policy that gave signals to those in, in, in Central America and those wishing to come uh, I- I- irregularly, without authorization, by the way, um, to come to our border and that they would be allowed in. That is, that they w- he would um, reinstitute cash and relief, which is basically folks come to the border, they run to a border agent, they get processed and then released into the country for a later court date. There also the question that any minor that showed up at, 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 at the border would be allowed in, no questions asked. Okay, so wait a uh, minute. Wait a minute. Dan, let me let me stop you right there. So you would get released for a later court date, but I'm assuming that these people obviously never show up for their court date. <laughs> well, apparently now the, the I you know, I talked to my, my nephews who are border agents. I have a, actually like four nephews who are border agents here in the Rio Grande Valley. They're saying that they received orders about three days ago that they don't even process them anymore for a court date. Uh, they just take their name and some kind of contact information and they're going to get a hold of them later. And then they're released into the country. Here, here's the thing. They also get Sergio. They get a check for $1,100 and a plane ticket to wherever they want to go. Huh, this is incredible. Yeah, it is. And so no one has an issue within the administration with the fact that let, let me phrase it this way. I had, I had my, my cousin who you obviously will, you know, well, Jack, you know, when, when they were talking about giving back the stimulus money, he said, he made a comment to me. He said, ah, you know, the government's not giving us anything. They're giving me, they're giving us back our money. That's ours. That's right. Okay. But I don't see the uproar with our money being given away. <laughs> to, well, there is an uproar, right? Um, and yeah, well, so, no, know. There's an uproar from people like me and you to a certain degree because sure. we, but, but I don't see the uproar where this should be an, uh, uh, this should be on the front page of every paper. This should be, this should be leading every news, not just the news on, on Univision. Yeah, well, um, it's, it's interesting because, look, it, it, on the one hand, um, I think it's important to understand that we, you know, we know that people are fleeing violence and, and those should have the opportunity to claim asylum, right? And, and have that claim heard promptly, humanitarianly, and, and with due process. And, you know, but we also know that many at the border do not qualify for asylum. And that, that, you know, that doesn't make them bad people. But that, that, that does mean that the asylum should not be how they get into the country. You know, it, they're gaming the system, a lot of them, and they know it. And we're allowing it to happen. And yes, it, this should infuriate a lot of folks. But Sergio, we just do not have the capabilities or the facilities or the personnel to handle so many people that, that are coming to the border right now. Because of this, you know, a new administration that sort of induced this surge. Look, this is not the first surge, and it won't be the last. We're, we're going to have a lot of that. What, what we need to do is to address our system to find legal channels for those who, who seek to come to, to work, right, and who can also 
to do so to, to help our economy and, and our communities. This has always been the case. But right now, our, our system is overwhelmed because we don't have the capabilities or the facilities to handle them. Um, and obviously, there's this push factor of the violence and, and the poverty in Central America that is driving so many desperate people to take desperate action. I've never been against immigration, right? Um, and I don't, I mean, I want to say, I don't even say illegal. And you look, my mom came to this country illegal. That doesn't mean she didn't break the rules and the laws of this country. Right. I think it was a little different in the sixties than it is now, but nevertheless, she did it right. But I believe that coming here and then forcing people to get tax IDs, pay taxes. And something that I don't see many people talk about is control the amount of money that is e that is being able to be sent back to Guatemala, to Mexico, to Salvador. Because if a lot of these people are going to come here and not pay taxes, then we have to force them to spend the money in this economy. What do you say about that? Well, I mean, it's tough, right? Because one, you know, I talked about the freedoms as an individual, you know, to have individual sovereignty. And the more that government restricts what you can do with your own money, I, 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 I um, will resist that, like instinctively, right? Um, now, what you're saying uh, would, would impact a certain segment of society and treat them differently and almost discriminate them. So I, I, I'd be resistant to that. And, you know, look, I don't know how you got your money or, or whatever, but you you do, as an individual, have freedoms and choices that you can make. And, and the more we cede power to the government to restrict those freedoms, I, I don't like it. Uh, look, it, um, at the end of the day, you know, I think immigrants are welcome, those who want to come and work hard and contribute and make America stronger. And we need to focus on keeping those out who would exploit America or Americans, you know, who, who come to do us harm. But when surges happen, you know, due to illegal entry, it does tax our system, Sergio. I agree with that. And I agree with you on this. And, and especially at the border cities, you know, we have to endure the, the disproportionate burden of that. And, and it just seems to Americans that we've lost order and control at our border. And so we need to do something. Now, we can do temporary fixes, but ultimately, uh, you know, when something undesirable like that keeps happening, we have to ask why and, and how to remedy it in the long term. So, you know, what, what we need to do is, is stop politicizing this and demand bipartisan solutions you know, and, and support the policy champions that are going to improve the, or make improvements to the processes, increases to personnel, to update facilities. You know, our, our border agents should be focusing on those who seek to do us harm right now. And, but, but there is no legal option for these folks to come in. And, and so you know, I think we have to be flexible in, in, in how we allow for work permits. Uh, the, the DACA community um, also has to be absorbed into our country so they can come out fully and, and produce and be productive members of society. Uh, right now, uh, our system is, is broken, and it, it, needs, it needs to change dramatically. Where do we go from here? What are guys like you who, who run the Libre Initiative, which is, you know, one of the largest Latino organizations in the country, what are you guys doing to, to help with this immigration? issue yeah well, we're pushing for real reform right now reform is essential and look we don't mind if it's piecemeal or if it's comprehensive we think the best way right now is going to be peaceful in other words piece by piece let's focus on a balance of you know how we handle entry into america but with a balance of also of security right you know that look, one of the, the important things here too is that um you cannot expect that enforcement um is going to be um is it, 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 going to handle everything. Um, the, the, the problem with, with uh, enforcement um, is that there's no way that you can enforce your way out of a reoccurring migration crisis. You know, it's like desperate people will take desperate actions and they'll find a way around the wall or whatever. Uh, and, uh, but what we need is our real legal channel because yeah, when there are no legal channels, you know, the pe people are just going to keep finding a way, like I said, around the enforcement. And, and so... Uh, yeah, I, I think, you know, um, temporary work programs are important. Uh, fixing our asylum system, again, where, where we have better facilities and more personnel. Um, but it has to be a balance of entry and security, uh, building out the capacity and, and the facilities. That sends clear signals to folks in, in Latin America 
that, that there is no expectation of you gaming a system that is faulty, you know, which is the one we have now, uh, that there, that you will come in uh, or, or you'll be processed in your country of origin fairly and you will be told quickly yes or no. No, then you get deported back. Yes, you, know, you come into our country because you qualified under these asylum rules. Uh, but right now, we, we don't have that. We're overtaxed. Uh, and we don't have the facilities or the personnel to handle so many people. Two things before we finish up here. How is the immigration situation affecting you guys down in Texas? Oh, man. Personal, well, you know, personally, because um, I know how it affects the country, but you guys deal with it right up front, right? You guys are at the battle on the battle lines. Yeah, no, look, like, like I said, you know, we, we are we're our transportation systems are overtaxed right now. You go to the airport and there's like 50 moms, you know, with the federal folders that say, please, excuse me, I don't speak English. And they all have a, a child on their lap, you know, who are being flown to different parts of the country. Um, and then the buses are full because they're being transported to different parts of Texas. And then, of course, you know, churches and third party organizations, charitable institutions are having to step up and take donations to help folks with clothing, with food, medical care. Um, our school systems are going to be overtaxed because of the kids that now have to be educated, you know, and, and taken in. Um, we have to accommodate for the folks that are here, you know, who have been allowed in um, where before they used to run from border agents. They're now running to the border, agents, right, because they know that they're going to be uh, helped, actually, to be absorbed into into the U.S. Yeah, where? Here in Texas, you know, in the border states that, that are facing the brunt of, of the, 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 the surge. Like, like I said, look, you know, uh, we, we're, we're very accommodating when it comes to legal immigration, but we do need order and control. We need security at the court. The last thing I have for you. Do you think that President Biden governs all four years of his presidency? <laughs> I, I would hope so. Uh, no, listen, we're not going to wish anything sure. bad on yeah. on the president no, of the United yeah. States, but for just based on age, health, you know, I listen, and he's not the first person I've wondered this about too, right? I mean, there's the guys yeah. that have run who I haven't voted for because I'm like, this guy's going to have a heart attack, you know? Yeah, uh, no, look, I, I wish him well. I, I hope that he's successful. Uh, look, there's no secret that, that I am... Um, uh, on, on the center right, and, and I oppose a lot of his agenda, right? Um, but he's the president. And if he's not going to be the president, then Kamala Harris is going to be the president. And I would much rather have a Joe Biden than a Kamala Harris because of the policy, right? Uh, what I care about is how you're going to govern the country. And if you're going to empower bureaucrats and politicians, I, I don't want any part of that. And I'll fight you. I'll, I'll resist those policies. If you're going to be one who's going to um, work to empower the individual, and secure our freedoms, then I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to align with you. I'm going to fight with you, right, uh, to pass those policies. But there's no question that Joe Biden is not a moderate and, and in fact, is, is more center left. Having said all that, again, he's still the president, and, and I do want him to be successful. And, and we're going to prompt him where we can and, and fight him where we can and then align with him where we do agree on some issues uh, like trade, maybe, or even immigration. Um, but do I want him to serve the four years? Yes. Dan, thank you so much, man. Like I tell you all the time, every time I speak to you, I learn something new. Uh, thanks, brother. And, and you know, it's, it's uh, I, I always uh, want to get up to New York and, and hang out, brother. Dan, take care of yourself. Dan Garza from the Libre Initiative. And you've been listening to the Sergio Rodriguez show, a show unlike any other. <laughs>